Um, I want to thank uh, the Dean and the committee for inviting me, of course. Uh, it's good to be back in Vancouver. Some of you know I try to come up here every summer. Uh, you Canadians invade Phoenix every winter, and so I thought it was only fair to return the favor, and I come up to Vancouver this summer. Um, when you make a presentation, though, you're always told never follow an animal act or after people have had wine. So I, 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 I'm a little disturbed, but well, we'll go ahead anyway. Not long ago, I met a teacher who had just retired. She told me about her interesting 30-year career as a classroom teacher and then said something to me that perked my interest in assessment of teachers now being promoted worldwide with what are called value-added models of teacher effectiveness. These various models of evaluation use some form of student growth and achievement test as a way of identifying good and bad teachers and rewarding or punishing those teachers for their students' performance. The teacher I was chatting with informed me that for 10 years she had been a great teacher, for another 10 years she had been a really poor teacher, and finally for the last 10 years of her career she was a great teacher once again. <laughs> Naturally, I asked, uh, well, do you want to talk about that? Because it's fascinating. She explained that she taught all 30 years at the same school in East Los Angeles, a section called Boyle Heights, if you know LA. During that time period, she only made minor modifications to her teaching styles and curriculum, but the judgments made by the administrators in her district about her teaching changed over the years from great to awful to great again. And the reason was simply, she said, that the student body kept changing. For the first 10 years of her teaching career, she worked with a largely American-born, upwardly mobile Jewish student body. The next decade, she worked largely with an immigrant Hispanic student body that was both poor and had language difficulties. And for her last decade, she served a largely Asian immigrant student body that had language problems but were not at all impoverished, nor were the families all uneducated. Many of these students were both obedient in school and received help with their studies after school. Who this teacher taught made her look great, made her look bad, made her look great again, at least in the eyes of the state of California. Her story impressed me since so many of my fellow Americans as part of our national, neurotic, and near constant search for magical solutions to our perceived school problems. So many of my colleagues are great believers in the power of teachers regardless of context and great believers in the power of numbers devoid of their meaning. These are two dreadful folk beliefs that affect the assessment of teachers in contemporary society. Let me talk briefly about each of these regretful misunderstandings starting with the misplaced worship of numbers, as seen in the Western countries that try to quantify teacher effects on students. It's funny you heard the conversation earlier. Um, uh, it's the same conversation. What's really important um, is not the numbers, but some other characteristics of teachers in schools. To assess something, an object, a piece of land, a politician, a teacher, is to judge its worth. Assessment does not demand that the data used in the judgment either be totally explicable or in a quantified form. For example, assessment by critics and connoisseurs has long been sought after and found enlightening, and yet the criteria used by critics and connoisseurs are not always explicable and usually devoid of numbers. When knowledgeable professionals judge the worth of a piece of art, the performance of a symphony, the preparation of a gourmet dish, the taste of wine, or the performance of an Olympic event, we don't necessarily expect either clearly articulated criteria or numerical values for their assessments. Of course you can use them, but we don't necessarily need them. Tests, surveys, scoring rubrics, and the numbers that they yield can be very useful in scoring movies, wines, Olympic events, and so forth. And if used sensibly, such quantification helps us in our desire to assess the worth of something, even teachers. But assessments are both insightful and useful even when they do not depend on numbers. Of late, particularly in the USA, the assessment of teachers by those who know their work best and can render professional judgments as to their quality, their worth, their merit, has now been found to be unacceptable practice. In the scientific age we live in, dominated also by business and economic interests, there has developed a penchant for numerical expressions for all aspects of human experience, despite Einstein's warning that not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. In the new age of global educational policy, aptly nicknamed GERM, G-E-R-M, standing for Global Education Reform Movement. 
This penchant for numerical displays results in a desire to assess teachers using quantitative estimates of student growth on achievement tests and to abandon professional judgment, inspectorates, the use of portfolios that include evidence of student work, judgments about the quality of the plays put on or the debates engaged in, and so forth. Dozens of other valued outcomes of classroom teaching, such as increased motivation to succeed, inculcating better standards for judging one's own work, better question asking ability, increased empathy for those with mental, physical, or economic difficulties, all of those could be used to judge teachers' merit or worth as they try to influence our children, but they are not. They are ignored. Only achievement test score gains count as a measure of teacher competence. Your province, like many US states, seems to have creeping germ advocates, individuals that want achievement test scores to be part of teacher and school evaluations. This is a serious mistake. I urge you to resist it at all costs. The trend is for more and more educational jurisdictions to require a measure of student growth, that is, a value-added assessment for evaluating the competency of teachers. Through one of a number of different methods, the school leaders use quantitative methods to decide how much value a teacher added to students' achievement test scores over the school year. The term we use is VAM, V-A-M, standing for Value Added Model. And with it, my nation's leaders appear to be bamboozled. <laughs> As I tell you soon how this doesn't work in practice at all, I want to first note two issues about the way we inappropriately use the tests we now have for most of the VAM uh, models. Current use, because the way ordinary tests are prepared, makes the whole system invalid. These two issues are rarely talked about, but need to be if you hear people talking about using your uh, FSAs or any other test as a way of looking at uh, teachers. First, there is the ordinary way test items are chosen. In most cases, the tests used to evaluate teachers are the same as those created to evaluate students. This is the original intent of the tests, but then they are repurposed to evaluate teachers. Anytime you repurpose a test, you really need to do a new set of validity studies because it's the inference you're going to make that's important. If you now are no longer making an inference about the kid, but making an inference about the teacher, you better have some validity claims for your argument. The ordinary tests were originally designed to spread students out so we know where a student is located, the distribution of students in a class, a school, a district, a state, or a province. After trying out items for the test, the test developers will choose items of intermediate levels of difficulty, say those with passing rates of 40 to 60 percent for each item. This helps to generate a normal distribution of scores and makes it easy to locate students somewhere in that distribution of test scores. But when the same test is used to evaluate teachers, there's a problem. Suppose the teachers in a particular school district or a province work hard in staff development, professional work on teaching fractions, or develop a great reading program that improves vocabulary greatly. On the test items assessing fractions or vocabulary, the passing rates will, of course, be expected to go up. Perhaps 75% of the students there will get uh, a chance to pass those items. What happens next? The test developers throw out those items that document teacher competence and then replace them with items that once again help to spread out the test takers. The test is designed to determine where students fall in the distribution and is usually quite satisfactory for that purpose. But the same test punishes teachers by removing the items that show the value they add over time. For teachers, it becomes a Sisyphean task. I love that word. I was wondering if I was going to stumble on it, but I didn't drink wine. It's a Sisyphean task. Like Sisyphus, every time they get the test scores up, they must start over with another set of items to be judged by. This is really stupid. <laughs> the second issue is this. There is no proof from a single test maker that the items they use on the test are instructionally sensitive. In recent decades, test items for most tests have been screened to ensure that they are not biased for any race or gender, but they may well be biased against teachers who are excellent and insensitive to teachers who are not. This is because the items used in almost all current tests have never, never, never been screened to show that they are instructionally sensitive. We have no insurance that a teacher who is really good will move an item up in terms of the student passing rate. Nor do we have any insurance that a teacher who is not very good will have a lower than average passing rate per item. If such insensitivity to instruction exists on every item, how can you use the total score of the test to judge better and worse teachers? This is a fundamental validity issue again. 
If the items won't move, then how can you say the score, how can you say the teacher was not adding value? You just don't know. Now, you all know that the total scores on tests from which we determine a teacher's value-added score are highly correlated with the social class standing of the students taught. But what we seek instead is a high correlation with the teacher's ability to teach. And we have absolutely no assurance we get that. So technical issues abound in using test scores from ordinary tests repurposed to determine a teacher's value-added score. Now, let me analyze in more depth the other naive and troublesome belief that I mentioned is associated with VAMS, namely that a teacher that is good or bad will be that way regardless of context. Everyone who is taught knows that is simply not true. Everyone who is taught has bombed once in a while with one particular class and succeeded admirably with another. I don't know, I don't know any teacher who hasn't confessed that once in a while it just didn't go right. But the root assumption of all the models of value-added assessment as determined from achievement test scores is that good and bad teachers are consistently good and bad teachers. You can find them, you can reward those at the top, dump the ones at the bottom, because both groups identified are consistently good or bad. Everyone in this room who has ever taught knows that that's not true, and it's a fundamental assumption of the value-added models. This assumption is wrong, wrong, wrong. We have unequivocal proof that the estimates of teacher effectiveness derived from every known value-added model, uh, every value-added model of assessment are unstable from class to class when teachers teach the same subjects to do two different classes in the same year, and that those estimates of teacher efficacy are just as unstable when we look at teachers' year-to-year -year performance. When the scores that indicate teacher effectiveness are so wobbly, so unstable, so subject to chance, the validity of that score as an indicator of teacher effectiveness is seriously compromised. You cannot have a valid measure without a reliable measure. That's a psychometric law. Another point to ponder, while teacher effects in the lives of individual children may be both direct and powerful, teacher effects on classroom mean achievement scores may be less direct and much weaker. If that is so, we are in danger of making what's called the basic attribution error because we will be confusing the power and direct effects teachers can have on an individual student with teacher effects on classroom achievement that are moderated by a myriad of other variables. Let me give a simple example of this confusion of a teacher effect on student achievement for a class. A confusion because of peer or classroom composition effects that influence achievement in the class. Suppose that in a class you teach one year, you have 26 students, 16 females and 12 males. But in a class you teach either later in the day or in the class you draw the next year, you had 16 males and 12 females. Would you expect your students' growth to be the same in the two classrooms? Think about it. 16 females, 12 males, 16 males, 12 females. Every elementary teacher in the USA I asked about this said achievement scores will be higher in the classes with more females. I think we already talked about the female advantage and how it's growing. These uh, elementary teachers I questioned, they told me that girls are better behaved, they do their homework more frequently, their handwriting is more readable, many of them admire their teachers because they want to be teachers themselves, and they are more likely to study for their examinations instead of playing with their Xbox or going online to play wor <laughs> World of Warcraft. Okay. And you know, you think about it, you're going to want the class, if you're going to be judged on student growth, you're going to want the class with a lot of females, and you're going to dump the boys. <laughs> My point is, is if, is if we judge teacher effectiveness by using students' test scores to determine the value added by a teacher, we are in danger of making attribution errors about the causes of the effectiveness. Forget, if you can, the very real and powerful effects teachers have on individual students, something we all experience for ourselves or with our children or siblings. Think instead about the teacher effects on classroom mean achievement, average achievement. I'm arguing that what we ordinarily call teacher effects appears to depend on the interactions among many variables. What do these include? Well, they're peer or compositional effects of classrooms and schools, curriculum effects, school leadership effects, school climate effects, technology integration and usage effects, district leadership effects, for pupil expenditures, professional development activities, and on and on and on. <laughs> Let me try to visualize this. The politicians, business leaders, and the public currently think of the influence of a teacher on a student like this. Teacher to student. 
But everyone who is taught knows that the relationship is much more likely to be reciprocal, more like this. In fact, all those politicians, business leaders, and anyone among the general public who have either been a parent or had a pet knows full well <laughs> that the simple model of influence that they hold is ridiculous. Relations with every child they have and all the pets they ever have depends on the characteristic of the child or the pet. Influence always goes both ways. Why people cling to this belief they know to be untrue or logically inconsistent is a common psychological problem and it's hard for me to understand. <laughs> and if we think about classrooms, it's not a single student. Then the relationship of a teacher to the students is more complex and looks like this. But students also have relationships with each other. They form small clusters, the nerds, the jocks, the cheerleaders, the defiant ones, the gifted, the special education kids, etc. And thus the 25 or more reciprocal individual relationships that a teacher maintains, each of which affects achievement, are also supplemented by dozens more reciprocal relationships with students as members of their groups. And groups is plural because the student has membership in multiple groups. The number and power of, say, the compliers and the resistors in a classroom, or the anxious and the non-anxious in a class, can dramatically affect the outcomes of schooling in a particular year. Yet such characteristics of classrooms are typically unmeasured, which is a major problem for every value-added approach I know of, because they can't ex assess teachers correctly. It, it's, it's a given in all value-added approaches that sources of influence on student achievement scores are knowable and or controllable. But this problem is merely the tip of the exogenous variable iceberg. The real issues are the outside of classroom variables affecting achievement inside the classroom. Now we look like this. <laughs> A definition of exogeny. In an economic model, an exogenous change is one that comes from outside the model and is unexplained by the model. That's value added to me. It, the models cannot incorporate enough variables to work. So here's the real state of affairs. Each arrow in this diagram equals one or more variables that are outside the equations and thus unexplained by any value added model of teacher effectiveness. The number of such unaccounted for variables is inestimable. It seems clear that many of the outside the school variables and the inside the school variables, as well as the more proximal ones right inside the classroom, are hidden from us. They lurk as unexamined exogenous variables. Or if measured, they're measured quite imperfectly and thus poorly controlled. And regardless of whether these variables are measured well or poorly, these variables are rarely analyzed as part of second or third or higher order interaction terms. But that doesn't mean that such interactions are not occurring. If you don't look for interactions or cannot look for them because of the limitations of the statistical methods used, that does not mean that second and third order interactions are not occurring. All sorts of things are conditioning other kinds of things in a classroom. All of us here understand that one reason for the use of qualitative educational research was the recognition that quantitative research cannot find reliable measures for all that occurs in schools that's worthy of study. Nor can quantitative research ever capture all the interactions that occur. Sensitive qualitative scholars have some real advantages when trying to understand very complex social systems in which you can't get all the variables out. American policymakers, and I expect the Canadian ones as well, appear blind to teacher by student or teacher by peer group two-way interactions, and they cannot ever conceive of three-way interactions between teachers, characteristics of classroom peers, and characteristics of neighborhoods from which the students come. American politicians have no ability to understand, or they want to ignore, the complexities for policy work that interactions reveal. In part, I think, this is because we live with the myth of the individual as the hero in so many of the stories that we either read about or experience in theaters, particularly when we're growing up. In the US, we always had Clint Eastwood as Dirty Harry, or the lone and moral cowboy, always cleans up the city or guns down the bad guys, all by himself. Gary Cooper at High Noon had to go it alone. Sylvester Stallone as Rocky or in his war films overcomes the bad guys, mostly by himself. My country is in love with individuals as heroes. So only one good teacher is needed to fix everything and run the bad students or the bad administrators out of town. Blackboard Jungle, Lean on Me, Dangerous Minds, they're all films with strong individual heroes. The most dramatic example, I think, is Jaime Escalante, as portrayed in Stand and Deliver, a movie probably most of you saw, very ennobling movie for those of us in the education profession. 
He was a standalone hero, rightfully admired. But what people don't know is that Jaime Escalante moved to Sacramento after his heroic work in Los Angeles, teaching calculus to poor Hispanics. And he was not as successful in developing a program there. So was it Escalante, the lone man taking on the world, the great teacher with great skills? Or was it the interaction of Escalante with some social and contextual factors that mattered? Same man, different context, not the same effects. Less well known is that Escalante also had students that volunteered to take his class. He didn't teach any old kids in LA. He taught strivers. It's a lot easier to get results that way than with a random assortment of kids. He arranged a particular composition and then taught them well. It was not random kids at all like the movie portrayed. Escalante's success and his failure to replicate his success makes my point. It's not often just the teacher but the teacher in interaction with the students, the school culture, the neighborhood, and the social context of the school that determines a lot, a lot of what we call teacher effectiveness. Despite the continuing American belief in the power of teachers to transform lives, and the many anecdotes that confirm this belief, and despite the occasional demonstration of a school or teacher actually having these kinds of main effects overall, the power of the individual teacher, independent of the group with which that teacher works, may be much less than most people think, much less than we want to think as educators. You know, we always want to think as a parent, the kid turned out because of us. Well, I don't know if you ever heard of genes. Uh, it has a lot to do with, if you have two kids, you believe in genes. If you have one, you believe in parenting, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> Let me now turn to the evidence of teacher instability and effects on student achievements and its causes. But I want to preface these findings with a discussion of the stability or instability of high and low achievements of all kinds. I want to remind you that luck or randomness and regression to the mean all play a big role in any case of extraordinary success and failure, which is exactly what value-added models are trying to do. In value-added approaches to teacher effectiveness, we search for extremes. Those are positions in a distribution that are not easy to maintain unless your measures have remarkably high um, uh, reliabilities. And what is used in VAMs, the value-added models, are growth scores of one type or another. And that always indicates a potential reliability problem. If you have a score, you have the reliability of the test. If you have two scores for growth, you have the reliability of both tests in a multiplicative relationship, and the overall reliability of the system always goes down. Again, basic psychometric 401. Anytime you want to find the top or bottom performers, even with one score, you're likely to be selecting a unique, unique pool of people, some of whom are in the pool simply by chance. This common finding shows up when we realize that not many companies or sports figures are deemed successful year in and year out. If any of you remember the best-selling book called In Search of Excellence, you recall that a number of companies were singled out for the remarkable value-added performance. I read it, I worked with students on it, we used it for leadership courses. Turns out the profitability of all those excellent companies dropped sharply in the next few years. The excellence was not enduring. 20 years later, the next big book in business was built to last. The differences in profitability between the 18 firms ranked high and the poorer companies in the same field to which they were compared shrank dramatically in the years after the book was released. These companies did not last as well as was first thought. As Nobel laureate Danny Kahneman reminds us, Stories of high flyers and their deficient peers are loved by readers, all of whom are trying to extract lessons to be learned from these cases of achievement and the opposite. But the real lesson to be learned is that stability is more often or not a myth, and that luck and regression are always at work. Luck and regression are far more prevalent than is consistency in business, in sports, and in education. For example, let's look at some high performers in bowling. Now watch. Watch carefully here. <laughs> he may be a high performer, but I think luck had something to do with it. Here's bowling ranks, 2008, 9, 9, 10, 10, 11. You have the first 10, you have the next 10. Here's the thing to watch. How did they change? Here's person number four in uh, 2008, Patrick Allen. 
It was not even ranked in 910, not even ranked in 2011. Here's the second best Rhino page in uh, 2008-9, ranked ninth in 910, not ranked in 2011. Under conditions that are really stable, standardized, non-interactive, eight of the 20 of the top bowlers that was in my nation were unranked one year later, and 12 out of the 20 were unranked two years later after they were found to be the highest performers in their field. You get the picture? It's really hard to be number one year after year. The value added notion is that you can find the best teachers and they're going to stay in that category. You're going to find the worst teachers and they're going to stay in that category. But that's kind of hard to do. Let's go to golf. <laughs> Okay, here's 2007, 2008, 2010. We have the top 200 golfers in the United States. I think maybe, maybe it's in the world, but I forget now. So there's the first 50, second 50, third 50, fourth 50. There's their standing in um, uh, 2008, uh, 2010. And you can see that it's very hard to maintain uh, their place. Um, stability is not the hallmark of many world-class golfers. Uh, in the first 50, uh, one was not ranked uh, in 2008, 10 were not ranked in 2010. Of the uh, 150th to the 200th best golfers in the world, 29 were not ranked one year later, and 33 were not ranked uh, two years later, three years later. Very hard to maintain position when you're picking people at the extremes. Okay. So even when the money for winning is huge, stability is not the hallmark of many world-class golfers. Let's now switch to the studies on the stability of teacher effects on student achievement. Uh, Newton, Darling, Hammond, Hartle, and Thomas found that even though a set of different value-added models of teacher effectiveness were looked at, model one, model two, model three, to see if they could find one that worked, and they all controlled for student characteristics, it was still found that English teachers' rankings on effectiveness were negatively correlated with the proportions in their classes that were English language learners, free lunch recipients, or Hispanic. And the measures of teacher effectiveness were positively correlated with the proportions of students who were Asian or whose students had highly educated parents. Now here's what you have to remember. These significant correlations were found after student demographics were accounted for by traditional statistical methods. Here's the big point. The statistical controls couldn't control enough of the exogenous variable. That's the point. They also found that English teachers were ranked higher in effectiveness when they had more girls in the classes. My students were right. That turned out to be true, statistically. And math teachers were ranked higher in effectiveness when they had a higher proportion of students who had better math preparation in the previous year. So if you know who is in grade four and you're teaching grade five, you want the kids from one teacher and you don't want the kids from another if you're going to be judged this way. Uh, those, uh, the authors, among whom is one of the leading statisticians in the world, says that the presence of significant correlations between teacher effectiveness rankings and the demographic composition of classrooms before and after statistical controls are applied signals a powerful composition or contextual effect that's been identified for decades. Individual student achievement is affected not only by their own individual background, a well-established finding, but also by the characteristics of other students in the class and the composition of their school. For the development of value-added systems, we see that a failure to account for all the possible classroom peer effects and the school composition effects is an error. So we need to be careful of that. Apparently, teaching a class in which most students come from highly educated families yields higher value-added scores because it, each individual student's learning is boosted by the presence of other well-supported and highly motivated students. The teacher can say, I got that class up. But the fact is, the uh, skills of the class got the class up. Uh, it goes the other way, too. If the skills aren't there, the class goes down. Um, so uh, what happens when we look at misclassifications because of all these peer effects and school composition effects? Oops. Oh, there's the golf rankings. I forgot to show. 
But the best 200 golfers, 48, were not on the top list next year. Okay, let's go on. Here's the data I'm showing now. Here are three teachers from this study I'm talking about. Teacher one, teacher two, teacher three. One taught, uh, each of them taught a high track, and each of them taught an untracked classroom. And this was in the same year, just down the hall, an hour or two later, okay? So what do we see? Teacher one was in the seventh decile, broken up in deciles, of value added. Teacher, teacher one did pretty good with the high track class, but pretty mediocre with the untracked class. Is this a good teacher? Is this a bad teacher? I don't know. Let's look at teacher two. Eighth decile in the high track. Pretty, she's up there with the 80th percentile of all the teachers who can get growth that year. But down at the first with the untracked kids. Is this a good teacher? Is this a bad teacher? I don't know. <laughs> then go over to teacher three. In the very top rung, this is one of the great teachers you never wanna, you never wanna get rid of, you wanna reward, you wanna hug and kiss, <laughs> except when they're teaching untracked kids. <laughs> so are these great teachers? Are they mediocre teachers? Or are they teachers suffering from context effects because you can't escape them? I think you know where I come out on this. That leads to misclassification errors. In this study, the change in teacher rankings and effectiveness was one or more of these deciles, 10 percentile ranks, 85 to 100 percent of them changed ranking across the two courses in the same year. 74 to 93 percent of them changed rankings by more than one decile if they were in courses in two consecutive years. Even over on the right, that's a change in effectiveness of three or more deciles in where I would place you as a good or bad teacher. And you can see that um, over 50%, 39 to 54%, if you're teaching the same year, 19 to 41%, two different years. So it's very hard to uh, talk of these as stable estimates of a teacher's uh, ability. Another study makes the point on stability clear as well. This is from Gary Rubenstein. In New York City, they believe they have created a really sophisticated system for determining the value added of a teacher. Last year's students' achievement scores are put into an equation with the following variables used to moderate the scores. Listen closely. It's one equation with all of these in. Growth score and uh, a poverty index, the number of limited English-speaking immigrants, number of students with disabilities, number of students with student suspensions, number of students who repeated a grade, the number that attended summer school, class size, newcomers to the school, and demographic information such as race and gender. All goes into the equation, chuck, 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 chuck goes the machine. Okay? The resultant value uh, added by a teacher is scaled from 1 to 100, with 0 being a bad teacher, no value added, 100 being the greatest teacher. They move the kids more than anyone ever imagined. Here is the scatter plot for the value-added scores from 2008-9 and 2009-10 testing of 13,000 New York teachers. Remember, in the ideal world of the VAM supporters, a teacher is a teacher is a teacher. If they're good one year, they're going to be good the next. If they're bad one year, they're going to be bad the next. Um, they're rock steady in effects from year to year and class to class, even across grades if they get moved, and across any class size and over whatever else happens to them in the real world of schooling. The ideal regression line for their value-added scores from one year to another would be one with few data points around that line, everyone showing very similar effects from year to year. Tony loves this graph. He's seen it before. Here is the 2008-9 growth correlated with 2009-10 growth. <laughs> no matter what they did, they couldn't get close to that regression line. Stuff happens, as teachers say. They don't use the word stuff. Okay? <laughs> all sorts of stuff happens in the real world, and you can't control for it all. The stability of the scores from year to year is uh, still bad, with the average teacher shifting 25 percentile ranks from one year to the next. They cannot figure out why such variability exists. I can. It's these context and peer effects that you can't account for. There are a couple of things to note here. One is that the correlation reaches 0.35. If you know about validity studies in predicting schooling, predicting job employment, predicting uh, all sorts of things, a validity coefficient of about 0.35 is probably in the average range. One year to the next, 0.35. SAT scores at college grades, first year, 0.40 at most. Uh, it, it's not out of bounds. 
So even though there's not a great deal of stability in a teacher's value-added rank one year to the next, if that correlation were interpreted as a validity coefficient, it is smack in the middle of the range of most validity coefficients now in use in the employment in military and other educational work. Thus, these data are still good enough to predict a few good and a few bad teachers two years in a row. That is the basic argument of the VAM advocates. Okay, so I can, with this minor correlation, I can get the bad ones, the good ones, and I can do things with them. I can reward them, I can fire them, I can do something. Okay? But it's not clear that this actually works out in practice, even when data is pooled across a few years. From the thousands of teachers in the New York value-added data set, Bruce Fuller estimates for that those teachers that were in the top 20% in, in 2005 and 2006, called by Mayor Bloomberg the irreplaceable teachers at the time, of that group in the top 20% of the uh, 13 or so thousand teachers, only 14 of them in mathematics and only five of them in English language arts were in the top 20% every year. So out of the thousands of teachers for whom value-added scores were computed, 19 were found to be wonderful teachers every year for four years. This is not reassuring. <laughs> Context really matters. Second, if these data were rerun, as this author did, he pulled out just the 700 teachers who were in their first year moving into their second year. You'd expect the scores to be higher the second year. Every one of us who's taught knows the rule. You do a lot better the second year than you did the first. Okay, you've been around the block. You're not going to get conned. You can control behavior. You may have even picked up uh, some ways of actually teaching co complex uh, problems. Uh, the correlation was zero between. <laughs> so if your correlation is zero and you expect it to be at least 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, then you've got a validity problem again. But the best case I know of for inane, immoral, possibly unlawful use of value-added systems is from Houston, Texas, which I always hold up as the uh, poster child for a lying, cheating district. Um, <laughs> my colleague Audrey Ammon Beardsley and our student Clarine Collins at ASU uh, did the study. Uh, let me describe for you uh, how it works with Miss J, who had 10 years' experience at the Houston Independent School District. In this analysis, scores between minus one and plus one indicate that the teacher's value added score was within one standard error of where other teachers were that had kids like this teacher's. So plus or minus one means you're tight, you're, you're like others, okay? Plus is positive, minus is negative. Um, over the four years of data that I'm gonna show you, the pattern looked like this in mathematics. Okay, so here's the teacher. Um, 2006, 7, 7, 8, 8, 9, 9, 10. In grade five, she taught math. First year, she was minus 2.03 over two standard errors different from teachers who had kids like hers. She was a lousy teacher. In grade four, she improved. She's on the plus, on the plus side, uh, but not high. Uh, the next year, she got up plus again, but not on the high side, and she nails it in grade, uh, teaching grade three in 2009-10. She's three standard errors above everybody else who's teaching kids like hers. Uh, terrific, but unstable. Here's her reading scores. Minus 115, did poorly. Minus 96, doing poorly. Plus 203, doing great. Plus 181, doing great. All right, now we got a great teacher. Here's language arts. Plus 112, minus 49. Minus 177, get her out of here. Well, then she's only minus 20. She's okay, okay, that's language arts. Science and social studies. Up over two standard errors, oh, up one standard error then minus two dramatic ones, and we had no data. Uh, but, but notice that she was positive when she taught grade five, went negative when she taught grade four. The assumption, of course, of value-added models is it doesn't matter who you teach, it doesn't matter where I place you, it doesn't matter rural or urban, urban, you're a teacher, you're a teacher, you're a teacher, you can do the job. Well, I, we're looking at data that suggests that may not be quite the case. Um, the Houston value-added model is considered one of the best in the country by some people. It's controlled by SAS, the big statistics company that claims it takes into account all these context variables. They're lying through their teeth, if you ask me. Um, and, and, and so uh, we should uh, keep that in mind. Uh, but here's the point. When we look at the total data set we have for her, her scores were also, uh, okay. 
her scores were also below average eight times, significantly so five times. Um, her scores were above average eight times, significantly so five of those times. So above and below eight, above and below five of those significantly. If you had flipped the coin and decided heads was a good teacher and tails was a bad one, you would have been right as often as this system revealed Miss J to be. You should also know that Miss J's supervisor rated her extremely high in four of the five years for which there were data, and she, and she received bonuses totaling 7,800 for her excellence in three of the five years. Miss J was also given a Teacher of the Month Award in 2010 and a Teacher of the Year Award in 2008, both awarded by her colleagues. Ah, yes, you should know that Miss J was fired for incompetence after her fifth year. I can describe others like this. This is just a bizarre system. It's craziness. One of the teachers who we interviewed in this study put it this way, quote, I do what I do every year. I teach the way I teach every year. My first year got me a pat on the back. My second year got me a kick in the backside. And for three years now, my scores were off the charts. I got a huge bonus. And now I'm in the top quartile of all the English teachers. What did I do differently? I haven't got a clue. <laughs> well, I do have a clue. And the teacher I worked with in LA, or talked to in LA, had the clue. It really matters who you're teaching. That really matters. Um, so we find out that, um, well, let me go right to that. I'm gonna run, run out of time. Okay. What we find is the teacher behavior when we study it day to day turns out to be rather unstable. Why? Um, we'll talk about it. But if, if you're doing the start of a unit, you do some things that are different than if you're in the middle of the unit or at the conclusion of a unit. So unstable behavior when you're observing a teacher is to be expected. And depending on the mood of the classroom, the, behavior's going to, the teacher behavior is going to change. So when we co go in with coding sheets and try to find teacher behavior and get a handle on this teacher, what we find is a lot of instability, including the fact that the weather changes what teachers do. And again, uh, Tony knows this story and was so impressed by it. Uh, I learned that uh, early in my career when I was observing uh, a teacher in um, Foster City, California. Her name was Barbara. And on my way to work, she would let me stop in her classroom and try instrumentation out because I was learning to code teaching behavior, higher order questions, lower order questions, behavioral problems, all sorts of things. Um, and so when I got a new instrument, I went in there, and uh, I went in this one morning, came in, waved to her, sat in the back of the room, and I'm coding behavior. And um, I don't know, somewhere around 11.15 or something, the kids get their break, they go out in the field, and, uh, in, into the, uh, uh, they go out of the classroom, and, and in this case, into the multi-purpose room. And I said, uh, uh, Barbara comes over to me, and she said, uh, what were we doing? I said, I was trying to code, you know, questioning behavior. I got a new instrument. I don't know how to use it. I want to make sure I can use it in my research. And uh, she said, what were you looking for? And I said, higher order questions. And I said, but Barbara, you didn't ask one today. And you're really good at that. You always have the class at a very high level. And she goes, I didn't ask one? I said, not a single higher order question. I have all these codes here. I'm ready to, I'm ready and anxious to code you. And you didn't ask a single higher order question. Why? She says, I don't know. I said, well, I, I, you know, this is really odd to me. She says, oh, the weather. She turns around and walks away. And I said, wait a minute. <laughs> Get back here. <laughs> what do you mean, the weather? She says, well, the weather. This is the second week of rain in San Mateo. She said, when the rain is on all the time, the kids can't go out and play. They have to go to the multipurpose room. They can't run around. They have all this energy. And when they come into my classroom, if I ask them higher order questions and we get discussions going, they go crazy because they all want to talk. They all yell at each other. She says, I have to keep the pace up very quick. So I ask only lower order questions to keep them in their seats. <laughs> now, this is known as craft knowledge or tacit knowledge. Every expert has it. It's rarely in a in a book, nobody in your teacher ed program teaches what to do when it rains, I bet. But, <laughs> but your best teachers know that on rainy days, they need to do something different, OK? So that's what I mean about context. Even the weather affects teacher behavior, OK? Um, the, um, OK, so we know that the behavior changes day to day, hour to hour. 
We also know that the effects on tests change um, all the time. Like I showed you, it goes up, it goes down. And um, things are just much more complex in classrooms, and we're overestimating the main effects that teachers have on students, and we're underestimating the interaction effects, and especially the reciprocal nature of all the influence uh, patterns. My point is that if the world is as complex as I'm hypothesizing it to be from an interactionist framework, then policymaking comes, becomes very messy work. U.S. President Harry Truman is said to have once asked his staff to find him a one-armed economist. When his aide asked why, he said he was tired of hearing economists say things like, on the one hand this, on the other hand that. <laughs> But you see what I'm describing. On the one hand, you do this. On the other hand, you do that. Uh, on rainy days, you do this. On sunny days, you do that. Um, we live in a complex interactionist world. And the economists were right to tell Truman that. But Truman is a policymaker. The last thing a policymaker wants to know that if A, B, but only under conditions C, D, and E. OK. Uh, I need to move along. So if the teacher effect from class to class and year to year is moderated by many different exogenous variables, often interaction, then value-added models will always have a validity problem. Always, always, always. Okay. In the next couple of minutes, I want to briefly document how ubiquitous these exogenous peer or compositional effects are. I'm going to rush through these just to give you the flavor of them. Uh, I have an article with this much fuller than I'm presenting today coming out in Teacher's College Record in January. Uh, on the same subject, so you can get more, di more data there uh, if, if you want it. But l let me go to Chile first and talk about that. A uh, study in 2003 by McGeehan, uh, he said, mother's education has big effects, father's education and indigenous students have lesser but still significant effects over and above anything else. <coughs> you can't control for it, it's, it, it's in the system. Uh, Lavi, Silva, and Weinhardt in England, they said, low achieving students affect everyone's scores. Boys and girls are affected differentially, but both significantly affected by the composition of the classrooms. Okay? Amar Mueller and Pischke, six European nations, social class composition affects teacher effectiveness. Schneeweiss and Winter Ebermeyer in Denmark, social cultural levels of classes affect teacher effectiveness. Um, Schindler and Anvid in Denmark, low ability students helped by the presence of high ability students, an interaction, high ability students not hurt by presence of low ability students, um, also an interaction. The, uh, in the Netherlands, same as above, Oaks in the uh, US on uh, track classes, same thing. Let's go to the US, Hoxby, percent female, percent black, percent Asian, and other compositional configurations affects everyone's scores in the classroom. You can't control for it all. Perry in Australia, uh, Perry McConnery, I should say, in Australia, uh, school social and cultural compositional factors outweigh the students' own social and cultural factors. What you bring to school is outweighed in performance by what the school has as your peers. That's a powerful statement. In the US, Rumberger and Pallardy said, school social and cultural composition factors are equal to the students' own social and cultural factors. So in Australia, it's twice as powerful, the compositional effect. In the US, it's equal to what you bring. We always think what the kids bring is important, but those compositional effects are quite important, too. Um, Henry and Rickman said it best, I think, um, what I wanted to say um, when I went through these studies and was trying to understand how powerful some of these things are. Um, what they said was this. The ability level of the peers in a child's classroom, this is a nursery school classroom, has direct effects on the child's cognitive skills, pre-reading skills, and expressive language skills after controlling for preschool resources, family characteristics, and the child's skills at the beginning of the preschool. These researchers concluded that studies that did not take into account peer effects on achievement probably overestimate the effects of school level variables such as class size, discipline policy, curriculum and leadership, and even teacher quality. This preschool study provides one of the few clear statements about the issue. Measures of teacher effects are probably inflated 
when we look at the outcomes of schooling without having really good measures of peer compositional effects, or without being able to control for them, or without understanding the myriad exogenous variables that are interacting with life in classrooms. What we see when we obtain a teacher effect is an average effect in any one year confounded with other effects occurring in that classroom and school that same year, resulting in rather unstable estimates of teacher effects on student achievement in different classrooms across years, across subject matters. The miracle, it seems to me, is that in the face of all this complexity, so many of our teachers do such a decent job of teaching year in and year out. And so few are actually found to be consistently bad teachers. Let me say again, so few are bad year in and year out. Though a few do exist, I've seen a few, I think. I'd really like to get rid of them, um, run them down or something, they hurt the children. But the numbers are really, really small. I see burnt out teachers, I see teachers that had a bad night, you know, lots of other things. But consistently bad teachers in some of the work I've done, really hard to find. Um, I'd be surprised if we had much of that. And if we gave principals more leeway in hiring and firing, they'd probably do the job without an elaborate testing program that's turning the profession of teaching into more like a job for piecework workers who are paid for the number of good apples they can pick. In my opinion, the research is quite positive about the profession of teaching, and this must be remembered in this year of teacher education. When the class is the unit of analysis, what we find is a great deal of competent instruction and a great deal of um, impact on students in spite of the amazing complexity that exists in classrooms year in and year out. What we see when we observe in classrooms, we see a lot of hardworking, decent people coping remarkably well with the complex human systems called classrooms and schools. And even if they were not as great an influence as we once thought they were on mean student test outcomes, their contributions to those outcomes is not trivial either. Moreover, their effects on individual students is occasionally lifelong, as was true in my own career and that of my children as well. Individual teachers mattered. In sum, the research from value-added models suggests that they don't work and they are now in over 40 US states. When looking at classrooms and schools, what we do find is much less of the extraordinarily great, the extraordinarily bad teachers of political and media myth. Um, Ronald Reagan used to go around talking about the welfare queens stealing all our money. There were three in the whole country somebody could find, you know? <laughs> then they go around talking about cheating in the voting booth, you know? Yeah, they can't find any records of it in most states. Um, uh, uh, Bo Speaker Bono was talking about the disability cheats, taking all our money. There are not many of them either. The extraordinarily great and extraordinarily bad are, are, are media myths okay, that we have to confront. What we see, rather than the extraordinarily great and extraordinarily bad teachers of political and media myth, what we see instead is a lot of day humanity and competency displayed in the face of complexity. So let's celebrate our teachers and protest inane, unreliable, and invalid systems of evaluation proposed, imposed on us by a whole bunch of people who really don't know what we do. Thank you for listening. Dr. Berliner is going to entertain a few questions just for a few moments. Uh, so any questions at all to Dr. Berliner? We have a BC education plan and there is a concept called quality teaching. I wondered what you would find problematic oh. in the concept of quality teaching and what we might look for. Yeah, let me be clear. I, 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 the, had to deal with this the other day too. We all know when you account for the variance in student achievement, about 60% of that variance is from out of school factors. It's home, it's family, it's neighborhood. And the in school factors, of which teachers are a part, maybe the most important part, but only a part, account for about 20% of the variance. There's no getting around that. Study after study shows data something like that. So the outside of school factors are three times more powerful than the inside of school factors. And when anybody talks about improving instruction, I say, why don't you make sure people have jobs? 
Why don't you make sure in my country they have health care? Why don't you make sure there's daycare, early childhood education, summer work for, for people, for kids to, to make up? To make it. it seems to me that we put too much on teachers when we know that they're only responsible for 20% of the variation in test scores. Now, let's understand, that's 20% of achievement influence per year for 12 years. That's a lot of good stuff. You can get a lot done with consistent good teachers, good schools, a good curriculum, uh, after school programs, blah, 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 that the school uh, uh, tries to, to work on. So working on quality teaching is to be applauded. Okay? And nothing I say should ever go against the notion that trying to get the best teachers we can in front of our kids is a worthwhile goal. But if you think that will replace um, jobs, <laughs> uh, early childhood education, or parents reading to their kids, or things like that, you're wrong in my estimation, you're just wrong, okay? What we need is a social agenda for kids and families and a school agenda. Quality teaching, however you define it, I'll probably love it. But let's understand it's the outside of school factors that are really more powerful. Compositional effects of a school and peer effects in a classroom. I, I do this with lots of people all the time. Let me ask you, and I, I think it'll work here. If, if you take a child's waking hours from birth to 18 years of age, and you say, how much of that time is spent with family, in neighborhood, um, in community? Um, how much of that time is spent that way? And how much time is spent in school? In the US, we plot it out. 90% of the kid's time is with family and neighborhood, and 10% of the time is in school. Well. You want to bet $10 on which is likely to have more influence? Peers in the neighborhood or peers in the classroom? 90%, 10%. It's a very powerful social system we're dealing with. Context really matters. But that doesn't mean that you give up. It doesn't mean you uh, to say anybody can teach like in my country. Oh, you want to be a teacher? Sure, take six weeks on a, on a computer and you could get certified. <laughs> I mean, that's really stupid. It doesn't treat with dignity what a professional can do for the individual kid and the 20% of variants that we can work with. Long answer, but uh, you, you tapped something I've been thinking about a long time. Una. Yeah, David, first of all, thank you so much for doing this. It's, it's a, a message we desperately need to hear at a time that's really, we're, we're at a juncture point. And, in Canada and in BC. Yeah, everything we do in the States drifts over the yeah. border, so be careful. Yeah, I know. It's a really <laughs> sad state. And, I, and, and I, I, I really applaud a lot of what you're saying. And, and people will turn around those things, they'll say that certain st statistical ideas will drop out of the heavens, like HLM models will solve all of this. No, they won't. No. The interactions that looked at there are trivial, and they don't capture a lot of them. And even my own research group, we looked at sort of what they what are called top performing countries on these international studies, and we find that outside of school variables account for an enormous amount of the variation. Yeah. And I remember one of the reviewers writing a very hostile paragraph, which are always fun to actually read, um, <laughs> very hostile paragraph saying, what do you mean outside of school factors? There are none. So we're, sometimes our worst enemies are our own colleagues about this kind of thing. So thank but you, David. If it's, keep, if it's keep not in the equation, they don't count it. You know? but and even when the it's number the of books in a home right. and the conversations at dinner are scaled in the PISA scores. Exactly. And they have enormous effects across the world. Some yeah. nations do better, some nations do worse. Asian nations do better than the US, and, uh, but the lower group in um, books and conversations and social stuff, the lower group in Asia is a full standard deviation below the higher group, and the full standard deviation below the higher group in the US. It looks like we have a one standard deviation difference between these cultural outside of school factors for the high group and the low group. That's an enormous effect. There is nothing in education that I know of that'll give you uh, a standard deviation or a standard deviation and a half effect. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, over there. Thanks for the brilliant talk, David. Um, and as uh, uh, Bruno alluded, uh, student achievement uh, scores are uh, not only used to rank teachers, but countries. 
And we actually in Canada like country rankings because Canada ranks pretty well in those rank <laughs> rankings. Um, but it's, it, what we do with them is very similar to what's done in the US. Uh, we try to make causal links between different pieces of these education systems and the country's ranking in the international assessments. And sometimes those are class sizes, sometimes those are different resources allocated to schools and so on and so forth. But there is a lot of talk about these um, high-ranking countries, such as Finland, and uh, what Finland does, and how do they come, come up with these successful students. And there's a, since this is about teacher education, uh, there has also been discussions about how they uh, educate their teachers, um, and so on and so forth. So I just wanted to see if you wanted to comment on um, uh, using these uh, rankings and what we can learn from Finland. Yeah. Well, I, I, uh, you, you know I uh, have already attributed Canada's um, pretty good scores on the international tests to your social policies and not your teachers. Now that could get me booed, um, uh, but the fact of the matter is we have one state that has social policies like you do, Massachusetts. has a lot of early childhood education, has a very low unemployment rate, has universal health care, it has pretty darn good schools, and they invest in them, and guess what's the highest performing state in the U.S.? Massachusetts. Um, it, it's <laughs> uh, go Boston. Uh, it, the, uh, so it looks like social policies, which is my point that I've been making today, is that these context effects matters. Um, Here's a, a little known fact on the TIMS study that was released in 2011, I guess it was. Massachusetts uh, ran, came in as a jurisdiction, not, uh, the, the US was in as a jurisdiction, but Massachusetts oversampled, they were in as a jurisdiction also. And um, Massachusetts black kids did better than the mean score of Finland on math. Everyone says, what? How can that happen? Black kids can't learn. Finns are the brightest in the world. The social setting for black kids in Massachusetts is not good. But they're getting good schools, they're getting good education, and for a group of those kids, they did pretty darn good. Um, the mean score of Finland, I mean, it's, it's an unfair comparison, a small group here, uh, a whole country there. But the fact of the matter is, where social settings are good in the US, Massachusetts, and where they're bad in the US, good old Mississippi and my state of Arizona, we don't compete well. It's, it's, just, it's just given that these things are important. Um, uh, uh, to show you the power of culture, I'm so impressed with some of the studies on, because you're a nation of immigrants. So um, let me present a, a, a little study to you um, that, that needs to be digested. Take a whole bunch of Turkish kids who go to European countries, main European countries, uh, England, uh, Germany, um, Italy, Greece, wherever they were. Uh, they're either born there or come as infants. At 15 years old, they're measured on Pisa. So German culture, I'm sorry, Turkish culture in Western European countries. Take a group of Chinese kids now living in Australia and New Zealand, either born in New Zealand and Australia or went there as babies, and going to school with the Australians and the New Zealanders. Now here's the interesting question. Will the scores of these 15-year-olds resemble the home culture from which their family came or the school culture in which they find themselves? Okay. Good question. Very really fascinating one. With all sorts of statistical controls, none of which satisfy me, I might add, but <laughs> an attempt. The Chinese kids in Australia are way outperforming the Australian kids who would rather do rugby than study. And, <laughs> and in Turkey, the Turkish, uh, the Turkish kids are closer to the Turkish school scores on PISA than they are to the Western European scores. I, to me, this is so simple. Culture matters. I mean, is there an anthropologist who wouldn't have predicted that? 
Okay? But we assessment people seem to have some other idea that cultures, well, you know, you can trade it in. Well, you can't just trade it in. You can't trade in your culture. Okay? So it's a very powerful statement about what context means for kids growing up, their family life, and that sort of thing. Maybe by the third generation, it looks like in the US, it's already happening with third generation Hispanics. They're really starting to outperform uh, their second and first generation uh, cousins and uncles, and they're starting to really gain on uh, African Americans in the US. And so eventually you give up Mexican culture, and you become very assimilated, and you begin to look like other kids. Uh, and then it's just a class issue. But you can't dump culture, and that's what uh, Fanega's uh, argument is. And he's got other data to, to support that, and there's another study that shows the same thing. I'm very impressed by that stuff. I, I keep saying context matters. I don't want to take away from teachers. I don't want to take away from schools. I want more money for teachers, more money for schools. I want summer programs. I want all sorts of things. But the fact of the matter is, the health of a society is going to be a big determiner of the achievements of your school. So I find this a bit depressing. Maybe this does take away from teachers. If, if achievement is so contextual basis, maybe everything a teacher does is also very contextual. And if that's the case, what do I have as a teacher to bring to a bunch of students? If the variance can be explained by just context, then I, remember, remember what I said, OK? If I told you you could influence 20% of a kid's life every single year for, for 12 years. It was a school, but not just me. It was a school. OK, the, the school. But if the school, the education effect is worth about 20% of the, accounts for about 20% of the variance, of which teachers, I said, are probably the most important of that, but there's other factors in there. Curriculum, leadership, that's what. But let's say teachers are the most important of that. If you could influence kids as a group, 20% a year, hey, that's power. But here's the important point for you. You can in influence individuals in that class for a lifetime. Okay? That's the important point. Teachers are eternal. They make a difference. And in fact, there's a book with that title called, Teachers, uh, called Touching Eternity, written by my colleague Tom Barone. In the 1975 or so, he studied an Appalachian teacher, very poor area. And he studied the teacher. The teacher was stupendous. And he wrote a case study on it, got published in Daedalus. It's a, a gorgeous examination of a teacher, his class, and his students. That was 1975. Tom decided in 1995 or so to see if he could find those students and find out if Mr. So-and-so had an effect. Those students, they would cry when they talked about him. He sat, one of them said, he sits on my shoulder. There's not a week that goes by that I don't think of him. That's what you need to remember. There's also the study of Miss A. Did you ever hear that study? The Miss A study? It, it's lost to the current generation. About 25 years ago, the Harvard Ed Review published a study called Miss A. Here's the story. This is a teacher who, who worked in a poor Italian neighborhood in Toronto. Her name was Antonetti or something like that. Um, this uh, graduate student at Harvard went back for a family feast. You know, Italian neighborhood, big feast days, everybody down the streets, they're all talking. And uh, they were talking, the big news was that Miss A was resigning. And she had taught every kid out of that neighborhood for like 25 years. She was the first grade teacher. And he's standing around thinking of Miss A, because he had her. And he's looking at people. And he knows the ones who had Miss A and the ones who had somebody else. He says, holy smokes, the ones who had Miss A all seem a lot more successful <laughs> than the ones who didn't. So, as a scholar, he goes to the school in the basement with every record kept for years and years, and he goes through the report cards for 20 years. So you have Miss A, B, and C when he was a kid. The next year, there's Miss A, B, and D. The next couple of years later, there's Miss A, and Miss A, uh, E and F, that is Miss A was a constant, and he could track the kids from her first grade class to their second grade teacher, third grade teacher, fourth grade teacher, fifth grade teacher, right up to the eighth grade. And he sat there and coded, and 
Guess what? Every kid out of this A's classroom did better than the average kid in that school. Whatever grade they went to. She touched eternity. When she was interviewed about this as part of the study, she said, I, I didn't do anything special. I just made sure nobody left first grade without reading. And they said, well, how do you do that? She said, well, you stay after school. You tutor them. I, I mean, the commitment of Miss A to make sure nobody left her classroom without reading was fantastic. And did it have an effect on every one of those kids' lives, just like this Appalachian teacher? So when, when I don't want to disappoint you. I just want you to be a realist, OK? The outside of school factors are very powerful. That's why we lose some kids. They take dope. They do something stupid. They run away. They commit suicide. They have eating disorders. We didn't cause that, OK? Those are outside factors we don't have control over. But we do have control over 20% of that variance every year. And we have absolute eternal influence on an individual kid. I would be very proud of that. Thank you all for listening. Oh, we have one more. I was just one very quick question. I wanted to thank you very much for your talk, but I also wonder, because we're involved in teacher education, what is the school and the kind of culture that we need to have in order to educate and contribute to quality uh, teaching? Well, I, I, in the US, my answer is pat. I'm an outsider here. I, I, I can't give you as pat an answer. In the US, I tell every teacher, if they're not a community activist trying for a better life in their community, they are going to get the kids they don't want to teach. <laughs> okay? So in the US, where we have broken social systems, um, I, I think I know what the answer is. My answer to teachers is always the same. I said, every fourth night, you're home and you're grading papers during the evening. Don't do it. Okay? That fourth night, buy a rubber stamp. Whack that thing. Good job. Whack that thing. You can do better. Whack that thing. Just, just give them the feedback. Don't even look at them. And instead, go to the Democratic Club, the Republican Club, but your, your three parties here, the Liberal Party, uh, go to your community group, go to the West End Community Center, talk to the old people, talk to the young people. Go talk to people and let them know what you need to do your job well. Okay? Teachers are completely apolitical in the US. Oh, you get some union leaders, sure. But the typical teacher isn't doing that. And unless we have people fighting for a social life, that gives them the kids they really want to teach, we're going to have trouble. Now, you have things that you can uh, fight for. Uh, it's not as broken a system as the US is right now. But um, William James, uh, he wrote a book, Talks to Teachers, in the eight, about 1891 or two, And he went on tour to discuss the book all around uh, the US. And he wrote to his brother, Henry James, the novelist, from Berkeley. And he said, I just gave a lecture here. And the, he, he said, and the teachers are like cows on a doorstep. They just look up adoringly, and they don't question anything. That's 1893. Okay? It's a profession that cares so much for the kids inside the schools, they don't think they have to worry much about outside the schools. Teachers are typically female, in elementary particularly, that means they have caretaking duties typically at home too. So it, 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 if, if you don't get politically active to solve the problems that you have, um, I, I think someone else, is, the minister is going to solve them for you. He may be a nice man, I don't know. But, <laughs> but I must tell you, I trust no ministers. <laughs> Dr. David Berliner, and uh, especially for inspiring us as to what is possible. I appreciate your, particularly your answer about uh, affecting eternity. Thank you to all of you for helping us launch the year, officially, the year of teacher education. We will put the winning lift up, uh, up on the YTE site. You've got a hashtag there. Uh, just remember those letters to find our website. And there was a wonderful first runner up lift dub as well. So thank you very much. And uh, again, to our, our guest, our last guest speaker, thank you on behalf of UBC's Faculty of Education.